Continuing with our study of polynomials and polynomial function, functions, in this lesson we're going to be looking at polynomials, linear factors, and zeros. And we're going to begin with a little bit of a review, perhaps adding a bit to it, and that is factoring polynomials. We did a lot of this when we were working with quadratics, so we're just going to continue on. In this first expression that you see, what can we factor it down to? You begin by looking to see what if anything, is the greatest common factor in the set. All these terms have at least one x, so we're going to factor that out to begin with. If we divide everything by x, that leaves us x squared minus x minus 12. There are no more greatest common factors, so now we do other things that we had factoring capabilities of from quadratics. Do you see anything, or know any numbers, that would multiply to a negative 12 and add to a negative 1. And hopefully your mind is quick on these now. You came up with a negative 4 and a positive 3. So this factors to x, x minus 4, x plus 3. We will learn other ways of doing factoring and factoring higher order polynomials than just quadratics, but it is a good place to start. In our next function, what or next expression, what is it that we can factor out? What is the greatest common factor of x to the fourth and negative 9x squared? And hopefully you said x squared. Because if I divide both of these terms by x squared, it will leave me with another x squared and a minus 9. Now this was one of our special patterns that we had when we were working with quadratics. It's a difference of squares. So this comes out to be x, x plus 3, and x minus 3. And if you need a review of some of those special patterns that we had, be sure to take a look at those concepts and be ready to use them because we are going to be using them a lot here in our study of quadratics. Now what does it mean for an item to be a factor? In the world of mathematics, if we have an expression that's x minus b and we say that it is a factor of some equation say p of x, or some polynomial, then that means a lot of things. It means that b is a zero of that expression. It is also called a root of the expression, and it would be a solution if we had p of x equal to zero. Another thing that we say, or that we see when we graph these, is b is an x-intercept. We talked a lot about y-intercepts in our study of linear functions. Now we're talking about x-intercepts. When we have a polynomial, the easiest way to solve them is to have them be equal to zero. So, when we go to graph them, we'd be looking for places that they cross the x-axis. These are the roots, the zeros, the solutions, or the x-intercepts. So being able to find these factors becomes of vital importance. So how can we use this information in order to construct a graph if all we're given is the zeros? Let's begin by talking about a factor theorem. The factor theorem states the expression x minus a is a factor of a polynomial if and only if the value a is a zero of the related polynomial function. So what that means is in this graph that we're going to generate below, we have it in factored form. What would be the zeros of this, because these are the prime factors, the prime polynomial factors, what would the zeros be that would help us to create this graph. Well, what does it take to make this first term zero? And that is zero. What does it take to make the second term zero? And that's a positive three. Then what does it take to make the last term zero? And that is a negative five. So we know that we have these three crossings of our polynomial. But, what else can we figure out? 
we know that this is a cubic, so it is an odd function. So our end behavior is going to be either this or this. When we multiply the lead terms, x times x times x will give us a positive x cubed. So that means we're looking at this situation here. We can select out a few other points to fill in some of the gaps. Uh, for instance, if we were to select negative 4, we would have negative 4 times negative 7 times 1. And that gives us 28. And the way I did that was I substitute in the negative 4 for the x's in the individual pieces and then multiply them together. What if we went with a negative 3? That'd be negative 3 times 0, or sorry, times negative 6 times 2. Negative 3 times 2 is a negative 6. Negative 6 times 6 is 36 negative 2. We have negative 2, negative 5, and 3. That gives us 30, so it's coming down. If we substitute in negative 1, we get negative 1, negative 4, and 4. That gives us 16. If we go to the other side, a positive 1, that gives us 1, negative 2, and 6, that's a negative 12. And the only other one that we really have to worry about is 2. That'd give us 2, negative 1, and 7, which is a negative 14. So this graph is going to be mostly off of our grid here. It's going to come up, disappear high, come back down, disappear low, and then come back up and have those crossings. If we change our y scale so it's not always by ones, we could end up with a graph that looks something like this. But we have the general idea and shape simply from knowing what the zeros are. So from a list of zeros, or from a factored form, we can create a graph. What if all we did have was a list of zeros? We need to write the polynomial equation given only zeros. Well, if we know that 3 and negative 3 are zeros, then that means we had some expression or some equation y that was equal to what would it take so that 3 was a 0? Well, that'd be x minus 3. What would it take to make positive, no, negative 3 a 0? That would be x plus 3. If we multiply these together, we get x squared minus 9, which is a simple quadratic. If we were to go through and graph this, we'll use a graphing calculator to speed up the work, we come out with this graph. Now what would happen if we were to do a different function who had zeros at 3, 3 and negative 3. Now you might say, hey, the positive 3 is being repeated, but what that means is that this positive 3 actually accounts for two different zeros. So let's construct it. We would have y equals an x minus 3, takes care of that one, x minus 3, takes care of that one, and x plus 3 takes care of that one. Multiplying this out, we get the expression or the equation y equals x cubed minus 3x squared plus or minus sorry minus 9x plus 27. So again going through and graphing this, we would come up with a graph that looks like this. And how are these graphs the same and how are they different? Well, ways in which they are the same is that they both appear to have the same zeros. For instance, the parabola has crossings of the x-axis at negative 3 and positive 3. The 
cubic has it touches the x-axis at negative 3 and positive 3. Now, both of them cross at negative 3. However, the parabola crosses at positive 3 and the cubic just touches. This is what's called when we have the same zero show up repeatedly. It's called a multiplicity of a zero. And if we have an even number of multiplicity, it acts as a rebound. We simply bounce off of where we're going. If we have an odd multiplicity, it will actually create a crossing of that function. For instance, we could have a multiplicity of 3 on a cubic that comes up and does something like this, and that will take care of itself because all three of the zeros are at the same location. However, like I said, if it's an even multiplicity, we simply rebound. Graphing these two on the same set of axes gives us a visual that helps us to confirm that, yes, in reality, the crossings or the zeros do exist at the same location for both of them. Now as we develop further and further into our study of polynomial functions, the concept of having these turnaround points, such as here, here, and here on these two different functions, will become more and more prominent. And what they create on a function are what are called relative extrema. Now when we were working with quadratics, we dealt with extreme values quite a bit. We were looking for the highest point or the lowest point of the entire graph. Well, in a cubic, you don't necessarily have an absolute highest or an absolute lowest. You have what is the biggest or smallest value in its general area. That is called a relative extreme, a relative minimum or a relative maximum. If we were to use technology to help us graph this equation, 3x cubed plus x squared minus 5x, we would come up with a graph that looks like this. Now this graph is a good example of a cubic function and you can see that it has a highest point in this area. This is called a relative maximum because everything in its immediate area is smaller than it. Now it is not the biggest thing in the entire graph that happens after x values of say one and a quarter but it is the biggest in its area similarly we have a relative minimum here that is the smallest thing in its neighborhood not the smallest thing overall but in its own area so we can use calculate function in order to find what these relative maximum and relative minimum are. On whatever graphing calculator system you use, you will have an option on a button or on the screen that says calc. Some rare ones say analyze graph. And in there you will have a minimum or a maximum menu option. If you select these, what it will do is it will let you open up a window. It'll ask for a left and right bounds in order to find something, and then it will look for the either maximum or minimum value in that area. If we were to do this with the grapher that I use, we come up with the values for our relative minimum and maximum as being the relative maximum occurring at a negative eight, not uh, negative eight hundred sixty-five thousandths and a y value of 3 and 13 hundredths, and a relative minimum at negative 642 thousandths, or 642 thousandths, with a y value of negative 2. So the technology can help us find these extreme values. You might have noticed there was also a point in there where you could find the zeros, or the roots, of your function, and we'll learn how to do that as well. But in this lesson, we got to see how linear factors can help us in graphing and what it means to have these solutions or these roots and how zeros play into our overall idea. 
Make sure you have these concepts down in the vocabulary ready to be used because we are going to continue in this unit and further to be using these ideas.